Hello, and welcome to our next presentation. On behalf of the MIT CDOIQ Virtual Symposium, we'd like to thank all of our sponsors who have continued to support the symposium during this very challenging year. Before we thank our partners, we'd like to ask that sometime during the symposium's breaks that you visit our partners' virtual booths. You can also visit the content hub on the MIT CDOIQ website for some great partner resources. We'd like to thank the following partners, Deloitte, Informatica, Privacy and Analytics, Dowex, Fusion Alliance, KPNG, Sandal Consultants, Tamer, Alation, Ali Data, Big ID, Boomi, Caserta, Citizen, Data Kitchen, Garage, Okira, Pylog, Click, ThoughtSpot, Eckerson, Global IDs, Snowflake, Starburst. And as I said, please make every effort to visit our partners, use the virtual passport, because without them and our partner support, this symposium could not be held. Thank you. Hi, my name is Peter Anley, and I'm facil facilitator for Track A here today. Welcome back. I'm happy to introduce Lisa Erlinger, who is the senior researcher at Johannes Kepler University and uh, is a, uh, works at the Software Competence Center in Hagenberg. She's joining us from Austria uh, this evening, this afternoon. Uh, she's going to be speaking at the ne next level of automated data quality measurement. Lisa, it's all yours. Hi everyone, and thanks for the introduction. I wish you a great evening from Austria. As Peter already said, it's pretty late here, but nevertheless, I would like to tell you a little bit of our most recent research on how to automate data quality measurement. So today um, we live in an era of data-driven business models. And we have already heard yesterday and today this morning in several talks that data is an important asset that needs to be utilized by analyzing it. And this is not only important for enterprises, but also for governments as outlined by Michael Conlins, Conlins for example, and nonprofit organizations. And a few other examples, very traditional examples for data analytics is for example, to gain knowledge of your customers, to get more insight into your customers needs or into the, your production process in, for example, in industrial companies, as we have a lot of projects here also at the Software Competence Center in Hagenberg with industry companies. And a very recent example for the importance of high quality data was also outlined by Lauren Gardner with the COVID-19 cases. Because Lauren already in her keynote, she told about the main challenge in, in creating this dashboard was actually the integration of the data and to ensure that the data is of high quality. Uh, sorry. And therefore, usually data is initially integrated in some central place, for example, a data warehouse uh, traditionally or a data lake. Um, but also Mike Stonebreaker highlighted that the that there is need for more sophisticated solutions for data integration right, right before the break. And since data integration and data quality, I think these two topics, they cannot be tackled independently from each other. It's very essential that when you want to do data quality measurement, that you take into account the heterogeneity of the different data sources um, in your company. And now you might wonder in the meantime, why I put a picture of the Mercat borough on this slide. And this should be actually indicate these major challenges for holistic data quality measurement in enterprises. Because first the data is distributed and single departments, they often strive for autonomous developments. And therefore they also de develop their information systems autonomously, which creates a lot of independent schemas in the data sources. And this leads to the, 
to the situation that no global domain knowledge is available, where you could theoretically monitor your data quality centrally. And how we want to overcome this issue, I will show you today with the tool DQ Mercat. And DQ Mercat actually stands for automating data quality measurement with a reference data profile knowledge graph. And since this entire description is rather long, we came up with this abbreviation DQ Mercat, uh, which refers to the cute little rodent. But Mercats, they are not only cute, they are all, also highly vigilant. And in such a distributed Mercat borough, as you have just seen it, some individuals always stand sentry and frequently survey the surrounding to look out for danger. And therefore, we think that Mercats are the perfect analogy for our data quality tool, which aims at data quality measurement in distributed enterprise information systems. And to get into a little bit more technical details, what DQ Mercat actually does, um, there are the three pillars um, I, I named them. Uh, the first is to exploit the power of knowledge graphs. Um, this is to provide a global homogenized view on the distributed local data sources. And um, this is uh, just important to tackle the heterogeneity that's usually available in, uh, in enterprises. The second pillar, and this is related to data quality measurement, is reference data profiles. So in our tool, we automatically create a reference data profile for each node in the graph, which serves as quasi gold standard to verify that modified data, for example, newly inserted or updated or um, also deleted data, um, that the, the data still conforms to the requirement. And the third pillar, which is optionally, is the blockchain. And the blockchain should tackle the problem that changes in the schema, usually um, uh, schemas in enterprises are not static, they change over time. And with them, the reference data profiles can change over time. And to make sure that these changes are globally visible and traceable and tamper-proof, we have the um, option to use the blockchain. And to sum it up, the three pillars um, of DQ Mercat are the knowledge graph to create a global, um, to create global knowledge for an enterprise information systems, the reference data profile to automate data quality measurement and the blockchain, which allows transparent tracking of the schema evolution. And with this slide, um, I would like to detail a bit more on the challenges of holistic data quality measurement, which I outlined at the very beginning of this talk. Um, but because I really think that it's important to understand these challenges in order to build a holistic um, data quality measurement tool. And here on the right hand side, um, in purple, you can see the intrinsic data characteristics. And on the left upper hand side, you see the external <clears throat> data, the usage of the data. And in alignment to Rich Wang's definition of the fitness for use, um, it is very important to consider both and also to take into account the context and the usage of the data in order to choose the right um, method and the right tool for your um, data quality measurement. And in terms of um, characteristics, um, it's important to, um, to, to, vary, uh, to, to consider the heterogeneity of your data. For example, data can be created fully automatically as it is the case in industrial companies with sensors or uh, machines in, in production um, lines, but it can also be manually created by 
um, in a bank, for example, when you enter um, the details of a customer. And uh, data can come with different semantic descriptiveness and it comes in with different types of structure. So data can, co um, can come from completely structured uh, relational databases, or it can also be provided in a very unstructured way. For example, also Lauren Gardner said they had to deal with the integration of PDF documents and to, to integrate data about the COVID cases, which is a major challenge when you compare this data to, to some structured data, which is much easier reused. In terms of data quality measurement, it's also important to, to consider if a gold standard, if some kind of gold standard is available. For example, with uh, address data, it's typically the case that uh, there is some publicly available gold standard to verify if um, the address is valid. However, in industrial companies, usually with your production data, there is no gold standard available at all. And uh, the last aspect is also about the volatility that needs to be considered, especially when measuring data quality over time, because this um, influences the frequency in which you want, really want to measure. If it's, for example, with batch loaded data, it's usually enough to ve verify each batch when it is loaded, for example, hourly. But on the other hand, with data streams, it's you, you need to continuously measure in minutes or seconds, depending on how frequently the data streams uh, enter the system. And in terms of data usage, of course, the application domain is important, uh, but also in which, uh, uh, in which step of the data quality life cycle, data quality should be measured. And last year at the CDOIQ 2019, I presented a survey on data quality measurement tools uh, where we observed different vendors like Informatica, Experian, um, Oracle, and so on in terms of their data quality measurement capabilities. And we found out that most of these tools support in terms of methodology some kind of rule-based data quality measurement. But there are also other methods for example, human-based method, which is rather weak in terms of uh, scaling when you deal with big data. Um, this is not really feasible. Um, and therefore, um, also in this talk, I would like to promote a new method into data quality measurement, which is the data profiling-based um, measurement. And the advantage here I see is that it creates a higher degree of automation than the man, for example, manual creation of rules. Um, also, Mike Stonebreaker highlighted this in his talk before that rule creation by experts just does not scale because uh, usually people can remember five, 500 rules and think globally. And after this, and um, you, you lose control over the, the sum of your rules. And usually 500 rules are just too little in a practical enterprise information system. And in order to demonstrate DQ Mercat, I will use real world data streams from Tributech Solutions GmbH, which is an Austrian startup um, that provides solutions for the audibility of provision data streams. You can check their website out. And since they deal a lot with um, streaming data, they provided us with the Audi A4, um, can, uh, with Audi A4 campus data. Uh, and here we see just an excerpt how this data looks like. And uh, for example, we, we have streams about acceleration values like forward breaking side to side, up and down um, and so on. And also information about the engine and the device voltage and so on. So just that you have an um, idea about how the data looks like for our demo. 
And now in the next few slides, I will explain each of these three pillars. So the knowledge graph, the reference data profiles and the blockchains by means of distributed data streams. So here is the first pillar is the knowledge graph and the knowledge graph allows to provide a global view on the data. And what we really do in the backend is to use the DSD, the data source description vocabulary, which is an, <clears throat> an ontological vocabulary. It's based on the resource description framework and the um, web ontology language. And we published, I published this with Professor Wurz in 2015. And this is, uh, let's say, the, the, the base for, for the knowledge graph because it allows to represent each data source in a standardized form. And here on the right-hand side of the slide, you see a schematic representation of such a data source where we have the, the data source class itself. And one data source can have multiple concepts. Concepts are, for example, it could be a table in the relational database. And these concepts, they have attributes. Um, for example, in our um, example case with the acceleration values, we have a data source, which is the data stream of the acceleration values. And this data source has also a concept and the concept has several attributes like the time, the up and down from which vehicle the data um, stems and so on. And on the left-hand side, you will see the machine readable form, how it is really stored, and also the visualization as a graph. So we use here GraphDB to store our um, semantic um, descriptions, which integrates very seamlessly with our vocabulary. And so First, we create a description of each schema and second, each element in the graph is automatically annotated with, with a reference data profile. So again, on the right-hand side, you, you see the description, uh, you see the schematic representation. You see that each element in the graph, whether it's a data source, a concept or an attribute can have an annotated reference data profile. And these reference data profiles, they partially, they are partially based on each other, which means um, that, for example, the, the, the concept, the reference data profile of the concept uses values of the reference data profiles of its comprising attributes. And on the left-hand side, you see the currently implemented metrics and they are divided into categories, which we currently use to set up such a data profile. And in summary, a reference data profile can be seen as kind of a quasi gold standard where the manipulated data can be checked if it still adheres to the constraints which are stored in the reference data. And on the next slide, you, um, here you can see the reference data profiles, which we generated for the three acceleration values of the Tributic data stream. So this is a completely automatically created reference data profile where no um, domain experts were involved. In practice, of course, I highly recommend, and we also did this with our, um, with our customer contact from Tributec, um, that the automatically generated reference data profiles should be verified um, by a domain expert. And in our case, um, Patrick Lampelmeyer from Tributech reviewed the profiles and found them already very suitable for, for monitoring. I will show you in the demo later on um, how, how fitting the reference data profiles were. Um, but here we found that the data, for example, in terms of null values for these three attributes, there were no null values available. Um, the, um, the most important uh, information also very simple, but in terms of single streaming data are definitely also the min, max, average, median and standard deviation values 
because they create kind of a, a, a format in which data should behave. Especially the standard deviation is important here because uh, with this information, we can also make sure that some, some data is just more, um, more static, more stable, and other data uh, varies more intensively, and that this, can, this information can and should be captured by the reference data profiles. Um, here you can see a visualization again with GraphDB, where we see the acceleration value. So this is the complete same information we've seen before, just in a graphical representation, for example, for, uh, for a domain expert who would be able to click through the graph and to expand the graph, to expand the profile, to look in detail on each value. And here, for example, you can see that the average value is selected and that the, um, that the value of the average can be um, displayed. So um, I've now shown you what reference data profiles are, but I would also like to discuss a little bit more the additional value of reference data profiles and why we think that this is really a, a, a new method into data quality measurement. Because um, if you look in the in theory, there are basically two perspective in, perspectives into data quality measurement. There is the theoretical perspective, which more or less suggests to start a data quality project with the selection of relevant DQ dimensions, which are then objectively measured with data quality metrics. <clears throat> On the other hand, you have the practitioner's perspective, which usually aims at starting a data quality project with the definition of a set of rules, uh, which then tackle specific data quality problems. Um, there is also this book by Laura Sebastian Coleman, who provides a great introduction how this could work in companies, how you can set up these rules and group these rules and so on. Um, but as already highlighted before, rule-based solutions, unfortunately, do not scale very well and um, are very time and um, human resources intensive. And both of these perspectives in the end are based on data quality techniques different kind of techniques. Um, so we suggest a reference data profile, which is just an automated initialization um, of such a gold standard. And this should then, can then be refined by domain expert. So we, what's now the, the, the main um, um, enhancement in terms of, uh, to, to, the, to the existing solution is, that we support domain experts in the creation. They do not need to come up with these rules. They only need to verify the quality of the data profiles. And in the current stage of our implementation, um, we use very simple statistics to create these data profiles. Although these simple statistics are very valuable already, um, as we have discussed with our company partner in terms of finding outlying values and so on, but our long-term goal is really to go here into uh, machine learning to use more sophisticated statistics, but to always stay explainable and to focus on, on explainable um, machine learning models and do not go too much into detail, for example, into neural networks and so on. And so, we can also say that we create the constraints that the data should adhere to. And this can be done by any, any data quality technique, basically. And we think that, the, that data profiling is definitely the start, that statistics is the start, and machine learning can be added upon request. So this slide is basically contains what I just said for all those who will read the slides later on.
And the third pillar I initially outlined is the blockchain. Um, so the idea to use a blockchain partially also developed yeah, last year at the CDOIQ when I attended the blockchain forum with Steve Oren and Peter Delenaire from Calibra. And um, despite all this research in blockchain, I still wondered about the value of a permissioned blockchain, for example, within an enterprise information system. And so I thought that the best way to find out was, of course, to get your hands dirty and to try um, how, how it could be used in our use case. So we think an additional challenge in enterprises is the different departments modify schema elements or also the data profiles in the central graph over time. And in practice, um, most of you will probably know that these changes are not always reported, but they are done locally and nobody's interested to keep the global domain knowledge up to date. And therefore, we think it, it's highly important to track these changes in the knowledge graph. And one possible solution would be a blockchain. So in our use case, each schema modification in, in the chain is persisted as new, globally visible, and tamper-proof state. And as you can see here on the chart, also the blockchain is stored in the graph. So it, this can also be um, viewed for, for the end user. And to dig a little bit into the implementation details, we use the very popular SHA-256 hash, which is used by most other blockchain implementations as well. Um, but the main issue we faced with the blockchain was the weak performance and therefore, and because of course, each modification in the global graph, it needs to be stored. And every time an element is accessed, it needs to be verified whether this is really the most recent element by comparing um, the hash of the element to the hash in the blockchain. And um, what we figured out was that the average, um, that the performance was very weak when using one large blockchain. So we tried to implement microchains um, on the level of DSD concepts. You rem might remember back the concept was the element below one um, information source. So for example, um, a table or kind of a customer of object in terms of ontologies. And Truly, we achieved a quite a huge performance growth with using these micro chains on not on the entire graph, but using um, si single smaller blockchains on the concepts. For example, when accessing a schema element, we achieved even a performance growth of 70%. Unfortunately, um, the entire performance is still um, still needs to be considered if the weaker performance of generally using a blockchain is worth of, of using it in, in this setting. However, it's, it's an interesting research question. And I think in general, we need more evaluations of um, practical, um, practical usages of, of blockchain. And in our case, we use all important four types of modifications. Um, for example, if an uh, element in the graph is modified, um, then in, for, for this respective blockchain, it just a new block is added. Um, or for example, when an existing concept is deleted, then the blockchain is flagged with is deleted. And the blockchain remains, so it remains visible. It remains in the status of the last stored in least block. And putting all these pieces together yields the complete architecture of DQ Mercat shown in this graphic. And I also would like to point out that we uh, published DQ Mercat on GitHub, where also the link can be found on, on this slide. I think it's also available later on for download. And we're happy if anyone tries, tries our tool out or you can also contact us and give us feedback um, on if you found it, found it useful. 
Um, however, as you can see here on the left hand side, we implemented a few connectors to access different um, data sources. And in generally, the, the core of DQ Mercat is implemented in Java, it's the runtime environment. And then the architecture is basically divided into two parts. Um, the upper part is required for the initialization of the system. And this is basically <clears throat> all the concepts I, I outlined so far. But what is missing is the lower part, which is required for continuous data quality measurement. And I will now demonstrate both phases with the data stream from Tributic. So to, to sum it up in the initialization phase, um, all data sources of the systems are uh, basically connected. And then for each of these data sources, semantic description is created um, also automatically. And this description is then annotated with the reference data profile. Um, and optionally, um, a micro chain is initialized for each of these concepts. Um, and the second phase is the continuous data quality measurement, which means that the, the tool is scheduled in regular interval, intervals. And in each DQ measurement run, um, a new data profile is generated from the modified data. Um, and this current data profile is then um, compared to the reference data profile, which is stored in the knowledge graph. And in order to store these current data profiles, we use InfluxDB because of course, this creates a bunch of um, time series data every time the, the measurement is conducted. You get a lot of new measurement, data quality measurement data, obviously. So we decided to use InfluxDB here and our visualizations that you also see in the, in the upcoming slides are done with Grafana, which is a customizable UI tool to display these time series data and which integrates quite seamlessly with InfluxDB. And here you see again the three um, attributes I already used for the demo before. And um, I here it's um, this is not the entire um, the entire visualization. Of course, it's an excerpt uh, for the presentation. And you see part of the reference data profile, namely the, um, the average, the maximum, minimum, median, and standard deviation. And the green line is the current um, value that comes in. And as you can see here on the left-hand side also, uh, we checked we, how many of these newly incoming um, data stream records really adhere to the reference data profile. And we were actually astonished that it was a nearly perfect fit. So the reference data profiles really captured um, all of the data in the case of the side to side attribute, but also in terms of the other two attributes, um, nearly all of the, the other um, records fitted to the data profile. And we also verified this, um, this result with our customer contract from Tributec. And they say, yeah, uh, it's, it's very reasonable because the, the reference data profiles, they, um, they, they modeled the, the data pretty well, actually. I mean, of course, this is one type of data. We are curious um, how it would behave with different, um, different use cases, um, but we will see, hopefully see in the future. We also did one, um, we also did a, a complementary um, demo with batch processing because I think in many cases, batch processing is actually more relevant in practice. Um, often when I speak with companies about data streams, I realized that what they really do is actually to, to ship the data batch wise in a central repository. And then uh, it's still in their minds, it's streaming data because it was created by um, some sensors, or for example, 
but it's then actually stored batchwise uh, in a repository. And the advantage with batchwise data is that more complex aggregation statistics like histograms can be created repeatedly and they can be compared um, to the reference data profiles. Because for, is, um, of course, with data streams, you're restricted. Um, if you get only single records, you are restricted to these values and cannot create aggregations. I mean, you could um, sum up the data again to batches, but um, this is up to the use case, if this makes sense. And here, of course, uh, in, in such integration scenarios with batch processing, it's, it's a pretty nice use case also because you could install DQ Mercat directly uh, when the, the batches is integrated and every batch um, is checked if it adheres to the data profile. And if it does not, it's not integrated, but it's need, it needs to be refined, for example. And um, here we use an online available supply chain data set um, where on the left hand side uh, we can see the changes in the data profiles for um, a zip code attribute. And it also can be seen that very often no zip codes are provided at all because, for example, the percentage of null values is 100%. And this is, of course, an extreme example that should be investigated more closely by a domain expert. Um, but on the right hand side, you see a more, um, more um, constant variable, the benefit per order, which um, seems to be of, of, um, of, of, very, uh, of good quality, I would say. And the, the, the number of decimals remain stable and also no null values occur, occur and so on. So, I mean, it's up on the definition if the stable is desired, as I already highlighted before, uh, we really wanted also to go into more detail into um, standard deviations because some attributes have naturally more deviations and can still be of high quality. But I think with the reference data profiles, these characteristics can, can be captured very nicely. And with this slide, I'm already at the end of my presentation. And I also would like to provide you with an outlook of our ongoing and, and future work. Um, and currently our major aim is to extend a relatively simple statistic uh, with um, more advanced solutions um, in ma using machine learning. And specifically, we are currently working in close cooperation with the manufacturing enterprise in Austria who, wants, uh, who want to integrate DQ Mercat in their data integration architecture. And since they use Pentaho, um, I also hope that we soon um, are able to provide a Pentaho plugin for DQ Mercat and an enhanced uh, user interface for the data profile refinement. Um, however, the main interest here is also on, in terms of machine learning, it's on duplicate detection and um, outlier detection. And specifically on outlier detection, we're currently um, evaluating methods like non-negative matrix factorizations, which is actually machine learning um, very focused or very good usable for multivariate data, but it still remains explainable. And also here, I really want to um, highlight that our focus will be on white box models only, which means no neural networks, since it's, I think it's really crucial to make statements about data quality that are always explainable. And I think there are a, many extremely um, valuable machine learning methods that are still um, explainable. And all these, I think, um, are, are very interesting to, to integrate in DQ Mercat. And so to, to sum it up, our main goal is the creation of a comprehensive machine learning based surveillance state for your data, which is then capable to characterize different kinds of data and also, for example, to detect drifts and anomalies um, as early as possible. 
Yeah. So thanks a lot for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions from the chat now. Uh, Lisa, we've got seven questions so far. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Number one, how do you go about determining a gold standard for data? Oh, uh, one second. I just stop sh sharing. No, I'll, I'll leave it as it is like right now. Uh, so the gold standard, the gold standard is actually the data profile. And that's why I said it's no real gold standard. It's kind of a quasi gold standard um, because um, we create it automatically and it should be verified by experts. But the, the idea behind is to use different data profiling techniques, like for example, to, to, to use a, a first excerpt of data, like for example, 5,000 records, and to, to use data profiling techniques to create a profile that represents the data. And for example, this profile states, okay, my data is, this, this attribute can never be negative and it is never above 100. Let's, let's put it that way. And therefore, this is kind of a gold standard because it's a reference, you can check your newly incoming data again. So if there's new data and this is, um, there are negative values in it, you can say, okay, um, this attribute is always positive. So this data must be wrong. And therefore we call this uh, quasi gold standard. Good. Uh, also, as for most DQ projects, the DQ strategy is the first step. Are there recommendations on where to start on the DQ journey? Yeah, here we think that the, in our case, the first start is to push the button and to create this automatically generated data profile, which um, is a rather bold move, I would say. Um, but it has the advantage that initially there is very little manual effort. But of course, as we all know, data quality is very domain dependent and therefore you, you need a domain expert who, who um, reviews these data profiles. And also um, it it's, might be possible that they need to be changed because um, there is some error in your, um, in your initialization data. And um, so I think it's a, just a different approach than, than existing ones because in existing approaches you start uh, with a lot of manual effort in, in defining all these data quality constraints with domain experts and we go the other way around by creating the definitions and then an expert say okay these definitions make sense actually so we just use them and other definitions they do not make sense so we reject them. Good. Uh, third question, if conducting a data quality strategy, how should you go about identifying which data should be improved? This, I, I think this is very up to the domain and to the main experts. And I think in, in every data quality, um, in every data quality project, this needs to be, um, this needs to be defined by the domain experts. So it's the, the, I, I think this is not part, part of the tool. The tool says, okay, this data, this is the data profile and the, these, um, this data does not adhere to the profile. And then I think that the human needs to come into place and say, okay, um, the data that doesn't adhere to this profile, um, for example, needs to be, um, improved mm -hmm. or it can also be the other way around that he says okay uh, he or she says that the data profile needs to be improved and this is also a valid um, a valid decision and therefore also the idea with the blockchain because also the data profile can have um, different versions makes sense uh, your approach is spot on uh, two questions. Number one, how do you propose to leverage on existing controls? 
Number two, is this framework in production and where? Uh, feedback and results. So the first was how, how uh, do you propose to leverage on existing controls? How do you propose to leverage? Mm. I'm not sure that if that's worth I'm not so sure about that one, honestly. Okay, how do you uh, propose to leverage on existing controls? Well, let's go to number two. Is this framework in production and where? Yeah, because I'm not so sure which kind of controls is meant in this question. So I think this is a little bit ambiguous. Okay. But in terms of the second question, um, it's not into production yet. So we're currently working with a uh, with an enterprise in in Austria, as I said, where we want to put it in um, in production. But it's currently, I think, it will not happen before beginning of next year. We're um, we're currently in, um, investigating how to integrate it in their um, integration um, environment. Um, and with Tributech, we are actually only. Got, uh, we got the demo data, but there are no and um, there are no real customers for it, of course, because um, they deal with data streams uh, with other customers as well. But if if there is any anyone interested, of course, in, <laughs> in looking for guinea pigs for the DQ Meerkat, exactly. Then we are, we are always open for research projects and um, to put this into production and get more. Um, experiments and more results, especially. Okay, good. Uh, how do you go about determining data quality measures for big data? Are they basic steps just to get started? Actually, um, all what we did so far is applicable to big data. So uh, we, we deal with big data. And in, if you mean with big data, also no SQL databases or uh, something like that. We also have a connector for Cassandra. We also make some demos because um, we, we did not write apply DQ Mercat to, um, to productive Cassandra data, um, um, but um, we, we made this case study with a company uh, in the chemometrics industry who, who have a lot of um, their process data stored in a Cassandra database. And so we the, this works. Okay. Regarding your slide number 12, do the practitioners understand the output of the data quality profiling report? It seems technical. That's true. That's very technical. And uh, so far, um, they understood it with explanations, but therefore, I also had on the very last slide. Um, the enhanced user interface for data profile refinement, because we think this is definitely um, uh, needed for productive, um, for, for, for using it in production. Okay. Yeah, and I think uh, domain experts cannot always work with these very technical data profiles as they are right now, you're right. And therefore I think um, a more user-friendly way would be needed. Okay. Uh, besides blockchain, have you considered other systemic change detection slash scanning options such as spiders? Um, not yet, but we definitely want to think about them because, uh, as I said, we evaluated blockchain and we were not sufficiently convinced. So the next step here is really to, to, uh, to research alternative methods. Okay, we have time for a, a couple more. The, the idea of having reference data profiles to data quality measurement hits the bullseye. Knowledge graph is heavily conceptual though. How do you make people understand it? I guess that's related to the other question. Uh, well, the knowledge graph, it's very conceptual generally, yes, but we have um, we have actually used the implementation for several years and it's based on the, as I said, on the data source description vocabulary, which is um, based on semantic web and ontologies. And so this is basically um, a knowledge graph and 
um, so it's it's real technical background there and it's stored in in GraphDB and also since we we still have a little bit of time I could also share you the visualization of GraphDB yeah we've got uh, 10 minutes um, can, can you see the graph no okay can you see still see my slides no okay then i'll share them again we can see it the graph perfect and so we store this in GraphDB, which is the here you can just see the visualization of of GraphDB. Um, but we have, for example, the acceleration value here, um, which you have seen on the slide. And, um, uh, the, and there we can see, for example, the, the forward or braking. And this has a profile. And you can, you can go through, for example, the number of null values. And there are much more information behind that that's now shaded. For example, <clears throat> you see the value here um, and so on. So we have the graph actually, um, although a lot of companies only use it as a, um, as a password. We implemented it um, with semantic web, um, with semantic web technologies. And for, for those of you who know, we used Apache China, which is the Java implementation to, to access the knowledge graph. So we actually, we build the knowledge graph, we store it in GraphDB, and yeah, we basically um, use it to store the, store the schema descriptions and the reference data profiles. Okay, if the source data changed the current metadata in target system needs to be updated. How could you use DQ Meerkat results to update the target metadata? So currently not automatically, but the basic idea here was to, to track these updates um, with the blockchain or some other uh, versioning um, tool. And because of course it needs to be updated and currently you can update it, but you cannot really uh, store the versions and make them globally visible. Okay. Uh, last one, unless another one comes in, do you have ideas for mapping the inferred entities and in reference data profile to public ontologies or industry data models? We've not considered that currently, but it's an interesting point um, because it would mean that we extend our kind of reference data profile to more public reference data. Um, of course, I think you need to be, you need to take care because this is very domain depending. And I think it's not suitable to, to use reference data for the entire implementation, but for specific usages to provide, for example, only the interface to do so. That's a very interesting point. Thank you. All right. Well, those are all the questions. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? I'm just, um, I would just like also to thank you for the opportunity to speak here. And I, I think I'm, I'm very looking forward to much more um, evaluations on TQ Mercat, um, especially to, to get results on, on the user side, how they perceive the reference data profiles, because so far um, the, the two companies we, we have dealt with, they were pretty happy, but I think their data was, was also, uh, especially in the first case, the data was pretty nice because it was streaming data and so we also look forward to more batch processed real world data. And are you actively looking for uh, test clients, test cases? Yes, we are. Okay, is there a profile of the desired organization you'd like to work with? Mm, no, I think it's uh, generally applicable and I think it would be interesting also to have diverse organizations 
Uh, we're currently working with uh, with the manufacturing enterprise, so I think uh, some all, um, complementary organization would be interesting. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time and for uh, spending your evening with us. <laughs> thank you too, and have a nice afternoon. You too. I hope to see you next year. <laughs>